Our next uh, spotlight presentation before we uh, conclude with our final panel is on mobilizing bioliquids and biogas in transport. Our presenter is James Cogan, and James is industry and policy analyst at Ethanol Europe. Uh, James, the Ethanol Europe is part of the uh, ClonBio group. His expertise is on EU climate innovation and economic development policy. He is currently working to support the introduction of climate-friendly E10 petrol in Ireland. He is a member of the private sector mechanism of the UN Committee on Food Security and represents the World Climate Ethanol Alliance as a partner to the UNFCC at COP24 in 2018 and COP25 in, in 2019. He has worked for the European Commission and his partners on innovation, finance and innovative uh, project development. Uh, we're also very grateful and acknowledge the work of James as chairperson of the Airbnb Bio in Transport Bioenergy Policy subgroup and for your work on behalf of Airbnb members on that group. So I invite James to uh, present to you uh, now, and could I just ask as well um, our panellists for the next panel, which will take place immediately after James's presentation, to make your way over to get mic'd up for the next panel. It's, we have eight, eight speakers on the panel, so it's quite large, so I'd ask you to make your way to the stage to, the, to get uh, your mics on here. So I'll hand over to James. Thanks very much, James. We look forward to your presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sean. So, uh, and thank you all very much for being here and for giving me this little slot. So, yeah, my name is James Cogan. I work for Ethanol Europe. Ethanol Europe is the old uh, uh, umbrella name for what's now known as Clon Bio Group Limited. So, it's an Irish um, bio refinery uh, developer and operator. And um, our main kind of brand name within Europe is called is Pannonia Bio. Um, and uh, Clonbio Group Limited, it's uh, fully Irish-owned, family-owned. It's uh, quite a large company now. It's only 12 years old. But uh, certainly Europe's most active bioeconomy investor, so we're spending several hundred million a year in new projects. Um, we currently make about 10% of, 10, 15% of Europe's ethanol, probably a lot more because half of the sector is shut down now due to the cost of energy. So being still fully operational would mean that we have a bigger share of the ethanol produced. Uh, we have a growing number of biogas operations in Europe, so we have about 30, uh, a dozen projects under development at the moment. Um, we're a bulk plant protein and specialty protein ingredients company. And the reason I highlight that is, uh, you know, a very important part of our business model as bioenergy producers is plant protein production. The bulk for animal feed is a soy meal uh, substitute, so it reduces the volume of imports from the Americas, and it's very important for Europe because it's the only thing reducing imports from the Americas. If, if our sector didn't exist, we'd have about 30% more soy meal imports from the Americas than we do now. Uh, but um, we are, I guess, people call it pivoting. Well, we're evolving very quickly towards being a specialty plant protein company. And we have very large bioenergy investments on the way at the moment, and our, our production of bioenergy is increasing hugely in the next 18 months. But it's actually on the back of plant protein investments. So big new operations built to produce uh, high-grade, high-purity plant proteins for animal, fish, and human consumption, uh, but where the other side of that same coin is bioenergy production. We use a lot of maize, barley, wastes, and residues. So we, we consume about a, a million tons of maize per year. And in the next couple of years, we'll probably reach similar volumes in barley. We've also got wind and solar. And we've got, uh, yeah, as I was saying, major expansions, diversifications on the way. I was really interested in Stephen's presentation before this one and regarding their transformation from fossil to renewable energy in their plant in Arivo. Um, two years ago, we were Hungary's, uh, one of, among Hungary's biggest consumers of fossil natural gas, consuming about 1% of natural gas on the grid. And natural gas was very cheap two years ago. And our uh, management uh, had a look at a whole bunch of energy tra transformational uh, uh, projects, uh, including putting in a biomethane plant, an AD plant, on site using residues from the site. Um, including a whole bunch of machines for recovering energy from steam, uh, including um, wind power. 
and none of them made any economic sense uh, two years ago. In fact, if you'd been a publicly owned company, you'd probably been fired for even suggesting them. There wasn't any payback on them. They went ahead anyway, spending 20, 30, 40 million euros between one thing and another. Uh, and of course, this year, as we've seen uh, two really huge effects. One is the company is very strong, in a very strong position, having uh, being able to consider a zero external energy operation if that came to be necessary. So let's say there was no gas available on the grid or it became so expensive that we would either have, we'd have to shut down. Well, we could actually operate with no taking in no external energy at all. Taking in some external energy, we're about 70% down on where we were two years ago, which is, makes us a, a huge difference. And it makes us, it insulates us hugely from the volatility uh, in, the, uh, in the system at the moment. Not to mention, of course, the positive environmental and climate benefits of doing that. So that's a bit about us. The rest I'm going to talk about as a kind of a, uh, the Erbea guy on transport uh, bioenergy. Um, I'm going to focus on uh, four things that aren't necessarily very uh, constructive, are not very positive, but I hope they're constructive, and um, they're the things that are upmost on my mind anyway right now. Um, so, there we go. So, renewables in transport in Ireland, uh, and that's all kinds of renewables. Uh, the official figure in 2021 was 10.2%. So that's the figure you'll get if you go onto the SEAI website, if you Google Re Transport Renewable Energy Ireland. Uh, the target for 20, uh, 2030, that should be 2030, not 2023, is 14%, which I think will be changed to a much higher number in uh, red three, even though that number isn't yet known. However, this year we'll see a drop from 10.2% from last year to 5% this year, which is a kind of a, fr uh, you know, a headline grabbing uh, piece of information. And it is kind of headline grabbing because um, it's definitely a step, it's a, a, in absolutely the wrong direction. So quickly, how did that happen? Uh, so total transport demand in Ireland is, uh, for, uh, is about four megatons, uh, million tons of oil equivalent. Um, most of that's diesel and petrol, obviously. And uh, of that, 0.2 million tons is renewables, so 5% in absolute physical energy terms. And that is comprised three quarters of used cooking oil, 12% uh, tallow, 12% crop biofuels, so things made out of maize and wheat and beet and so on, 2.5% uh, other biofuel, mostly uh, ethanol from uh, whey uh, and starch residues and about 1% of renewable electricity. So then the, the electricity, if you put that as a percentage of total transport energy, is about 0 0.05. So clearly, uh, used cooking oil is uh, really the, the, the huge uh, part of this whole equation. As we've seen since 2013, as renewable energy has grown in the transport sector in Ireland, we can see that it's all been down to used cooking oil, essentially. So as we've gone from uh, um, you know, 1.6%, uh, no, as we've gone from 100,000 tons of uh, 60,000, uh, sorry, excuse me, 100,000 tons of um, oil equivalent in 2013 to 180 uh, last year, uh, the bulk of that increase was used cooking oil increases along the way. And, you know, that could be a good thing. It would be a good thing. Uh, in all other things being equal. But obviously, resting on one type of feedstock is risky in itself, as you can imagine. But used cooking oil was a particularly risky thing to rest on. Uh, in 2018, so we're now nearly four years ago, uh, we signed uh, the new Renewable Energy Directive to cover the period for 2020 to 2030. So Ireland signed it just as the other 28, 27 member states did as well. In that directive, there's a provision that limits the consumption of used cooking oil and also tallow, but it's mostly cooking oil is the at issue here, to 1.7% of our total transport energy demand in any member state. For some reason, Ireland didn't spot this, despite it being our biggest, the biggest element of our transport, our, our renewable transport system, and despite Ireland being by far my by a huge amount, Europe's biggest consumer of used cooking oil per capita. Uh, it just wasn't spotted. 
Um, earlier this year, Ireland realized this dreadful mistake. I think it was probably me who said it to him because I was on a, I was on a, 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 a Teams meeting with uh, department officials and some other people and I saw a presentation in which the consumption of used cooking oil was to I increase and it, it was imagined that it was going to increase. And I couldn't understand how, if we were transposing already to this year, how we were going to increase uh, used cooking oil. Uh, the Irish government then tried to get an exemption from Brussels, and Brussels said no. And now Ireland isn't the only country, but we're by far the worst affected by the fact that Brussels said no. There is about, about 10 other countries that are above that limit, but they have a much more diverse uh, basis uh, for the renewal system in, in transport. Um, so we've essentially dropped from 10% um, uh, to 5% overnight at the stroke of a pen. There's nothing, nothing we can do about it. Uh, why did it happen? Well, the European Commission is asleep at the wheel in terms of managing the directive in the first place. As far back as 2016, the European Court of Auditors called out the Commission for having a weak certification and traceability process for uh, things like used cooking oil. It's not an issue where we produce the biofuels in Europe. So, you know, any biofuel produced in, our, uh, in Ireland from Irish feedstocks, so whether it's Irish cooking oil or Irish tallow or Irish supermarket waste or anything like that is highly traceable and certified because it gets traced and certified, it gets audited. Uh, there are auditors in viewing every step of the process. But once it comes from outside Europe, that traceability and certification process becomes extraordinarily weak and you're depending on uh, many layers of far distant organizations over which you've really very little control. Um, so the certification process is weak. It's widely known that the process is weak and fraud is rife with used cooking oil. Uh, a, a significant portion of it is very likely to be palm oil uh, relabeled as cooking oil. So that's why uh, there was this clampdown. Imported you go to Europe accounts for about 2 million tons of biofuel. That's a very, very large portion of the biofuel uh, in, in the European system overall. And it should it shouldn't have been there in the first place. There was, no, there was no way on earth that that directive in 2008 was designed to encourage imports from Southeast Asia, from palm oil regions. I mean, the, 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 the people who architected that legislation did not think, oh, let's hope that we get lots of used cooking oil in from Malaysia and Indonesia, where they happen to make lots of palm oil. Uh, so what we're losing out, and there's people in this room, it's us, we're losing out on a two million ton per year market that's going to imports that should never have happened. And essentially, it's the, the used cooking oil is the kind of balancing figure in any country's system now. You can't get enough renewables in your transport, get more used cooking oil. And that's what, we, that's what has to be stopped. So in a way, it's very painful for everybody to have to stop now, but it's also an opportunity for the people who are actually making genuine renewable energy in Europe from European feedstocks. Uh, the European Commission, they're just not doing anything about it. It's just absurd. But neither are the member states. There's a kind of... Uh, no victim here, but the victim is the people in this room, apart from, you know, the forests uh, where that big being cut down to produce more palm oil. Where does it leave us now for Ireland? Well, we're back to 2013 levels of renewables. Now, just for the people in the room who are maybe already confused by what's going on here, I can confuse them even more. The drop from 10% to 5% is according to the Renewable Energy Direct Accounting Rules. We're actually half those numbers anyway, so we're dropping from 5% to 2.5% in absolute terms. But there's a, there's a kind of a reward mechanism for waste-based biofuels that doubles it up. So if you've got 2.5%, you get to double it up to 5%. So it's actually possibly even worse in a certain sense than it seems. It's 2.5% in actual terms, but it's 5% we've dropped to in according to OED accounting rules. What it means is we've much more work to do to reach the 14% or higher target by 2030. It's going to be higher, we know that. Uh, we knew in 2018 that RED 2 wouldn't survive, and it won't, and RED, uh, it'll be replaced by RED 3 and possibly by RED 4, if any of this system survives at all, to be quite honest, because it's so inadequate for, uh, compared to the challenge we have. So we've an inadequate legislation that we're having difficulty reaching, uh, so it's a, double, a doubly uh, kind of uh, traumatic crisis for us all. In the meantime, the Irish government, having kind of made the mistake, can't turn around to the fuel companies and say, you can't, you've got to rein back in on your used cooking oil. So the fuel companies in Ireland are still allowed to uh, use as much used cooking oil as they want in order to comply with the local regulations here. Uh, 
So the government is in this horrible situation whereby the, at home it's allowing, us all, it's allowing the industry to use, use of cooking oil, whereas in Europe and in, under the kind of official SEAI and European accounting mechanism, it can't use that cooking oil to comply. Um, so sooner or later the government will have to ratchet back, you know, rein back in the amount of used cooking oil that's being used in Ireland. And I don't think they know yet how and wh uh, when to do that. Well, we, certainly we have no hints. Um, clearly, nobody in Ireland is really going to suffer because, um, well, are few enough because for the most part the people in this room are producing stuff out of local feedstocks. The oil companies are not doing anything illegal, so the government will have to, to enable them to adapt without penalising them. So it's going to be a kind of a, a government-designed um, get-out-of-jail mechanism here. But there is one risk for Ireland and for anybody else in Europe that is using or relying on used cooking oil and tallow as well to comply with the regulations is that as we rein back into the 1.7 percent the people that survive are the southeast asians and not the genuine traceable local stuff and that's where the irish government if there's anybody in the room dealing with it any uh, or or uh, european commission or any other kind of le regulators that's where they need to be looking at that's that's the awful thing is that we could get back down to 1%, 1.7%, and it could be palm oil. Uh, other couple of topics. So I'm an E10 guy. We make a lot of ethanol for years. I've been going around these conferences saying and, and meeting uh, uh, government officials and uh, ministers. I've been through three ministers for energy now, met them all. The la I met two recently together, and they both said, is E10 not in yet? We thought we'd sort of that. And so we're still here. Uh, I thought maybe we'd get in before a lot of other countries, but we're actually last. We still haven't got there. So we're still procrastinating over introducing uh, uh, petrol with 10% ethanol in it. Most of the EU is already there. It's been the European standard since 2013. No barriers, cheapest way to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Um, it may come early next year, but no guarantee of that. And I, I guess, frankly, uh, we've lost confidence in things happening. Uh, you know, we we tend to take a very conservative view of any dates given to us now by the by the by the government. I guess the burning platform now is that if it is that close, then the fuel companies need to know because they procure in advance. So you can't tell them it's going to be January uh, in December. You have to give them you know a quarter uh, a quarter of a year's advance notice. So that's one of the topics on our end. A bit. Next one. In the Climate Action Plan 2021, the government had one of its actions was to do a review of the supply of renewable transport fuels in Ireland, so the, the availability of feedstocks and the sustainability of feedstocks. That was published yesterday, so probably nobody in the room yet has, has had a chance to go through it. It should be withdrawn immediately, uh, absolutely. It's a disgrace. Uh, why? Well, they did it as a closed, uh, a, 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 a desk research behind closed doors. We knew they were doing it because we knew it was in the Climate Action Plan, it had to be done this year. We contacted them and said, are you doing it? They said, yeah, we are doing it. That's interesting, you should know that. And he said, okay, well, let's talk about it because we know about this stuff. We know about the markets for feedstock, uh, for biomass, for biofuels. We know the dynamics of it. We know the volumes we have. Yeah, we're we're uh, extremely um, uh, uh, familiar with uh, the data and the empiricals on this. And they said, no, we're not doing it. We're doing it, it's closed. You can't participate. There's no consultation. We're not going to ask you. So essentially, it's some people sitting in a room Googling for a few weeks. And what do people Googling find? They find stuff that was produced by other people who Googled a couple of years ago. And you, you're, in a, you're in a bubble. You're in an echo chamber of stuff that's been written. Now, I have to say, the report has lots of good stuff in it. I'm not saying that. But it's also very important for the things it doesn't have. Because if you're only do, using Google and you don't talk to people and you don't, you don't know what you don't know, and this report is full of stuff that they don't know they don't know. And for that reason, it should be, it should be withdrawn and reviewed and, uh, and published again at a later date. So just to give you an example, well, first of all, the, it uses Tim and Leap model, models, which are kind of highly analytical systems for modeling uh, kind of economic and supply chain data to look at a whole bunch of things. Um, We've looked at these in detail also in, with how the European Commission uses them. Um, they're done in a vacuum. They're, the data that, that goes into them is an, inaccurate. The assumptions that go in, into them is inaccurate. But most importantly, the models aren't validated. So you, you set up an analytical model. You should validate it uh, you know, a couple of years later. You pack in the data from two years ago and see if the actual real world 
reflects what your model says and tune it seems, uh, according to, accordingly. And I don't believe these models are running that way. I don't believe the data is accurate. I don't believe it's validated. Uh, the authors were uninformed of the prospects for uh, indigenous production. We could make Ireland uh, self-sufficient in biofuels inside a couple of years, as opposed to importing over 80%. Uh, uninformed is the role of biomethane. There's nothing about biomethane for transport at all. Uncritical acceptance of the crop, crop cap. Uh, Ireland has imposed a crop cap of 2% on the biofuels it's going to use. It's an arbitrary cap. There's no reason for doing it. It was put on there years ago. Nobody remembers why. No other country is that low, or virtually no other country. France is 7%. Uh, we're not going to get out of the climate crisis by having a crop cap of 2%. But if you do a study of biomass availability, the first thing you should do is at least say, is that worth have, keeping or not? So we definitely missed opportunity. It needs to be withdrawn. Minister Ryan, I met him on a plane a couple of weeks ago, he was coming back from the emergency meeting of uh, ministers. He told me about the 200 biogas facilities to be built by 2030 for five terawatt hours of biomethane. He asked me to come in and talk at some stage. I'm sure he's asked lots of people in this room. But it's, it, nobody understands where that's coming from, what the actual basis for that uh, strategy is. At least we don't, and we're big investors. I know there are other big investors in this room as well, but we, and I met a guy at lunch, uh, Charles, who I have to say changed my mind a little bit, but he's very positive. But we're not, and at the moment our attitude to investing big in Ireland is pretty medium to poor. A standing invitation to government, to any other energy policy influencers, anybody else, to come and visit our huge 44-acre bioenergy uh, campus and growing and any of the other projects we have. Um, I, we've definitely invited the government over and over and over again, and the European Commission, never getting any responses. Don't know how they can do, how they can actually uh, imagine to develop a renewable energy policy and not come and visit a few bioenergy campuses like ours. We're Irish, full, it's like visiting an Irish village, even though it's not in Ireland. The invitation is always open. And if anybody else would like to, or to talk to me about anything else, uh, I'd love to uh, hear from them. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, James, for your presentation. Certainly many points to further explore over the coming weeks and months, uh, which you have um, mentioned in your, in your presentation.